Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to another uh, Courage session uh, as part of the Texas Health Education Service. Uh, we all recognize that this is a very weird application cycle. And so we're, we're really proud to bring some of the uh, key uh, players uh, in the overall application process, preparation process, and just folks that can help encourage you to um, continue on the path that you've been working on for so long. We shouldn't let, um, to coin Dr. Kellaway's phrase uh, from earlier, we shouldn't let one one uh, semester trip you up from your overall goal. So um, let's do some quick introductions. Uh, my name is Enrique Hasso. I'm the Associate Director for the Texas Health Education Service. And joining me today is uh, Dr. Beck and Dr. Kellaway. Dr. Beck, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Uh I'm Deb Beck. I'm uh, the advising coordinator at uh, the Texas Health Education Service and formerly of UNT, the director of the education, uh, health professions education there for about 18 years. Dr. Calloway? Thank you. I'm uh, Judy Ann Calloway. I right now am uh, the associate dean for admissions and outreach at the Long School of Medicine in San Antonio. I, uh, one day a week, I do ophthalmology, so I'm an eye surgeon, and um, what else? I've done admissions for a couple of decades, two and a half decades, so at one, been on the committee for a long, long, long time, um, and one of my favorite things to do is to help people with this path. And we're so thankful to have you. Um, Thanks. Clearly, you're very busy, and the application cycle did just start. So I want to go ahead and just dig into some of the questions that we heard from a lot of our applicants. I'm pulling them up now. Um, and I think a lot of them have to do with, you know, this new application cycle. Uh, but also a lot of them are just lingering questions from previous application cycles. So the first one I want to ask is, on the TMDSAS application, applicants are able to identify themselves as non-traditional. Um, and during the uh, dean's meetings, advisory council meetings that we have, um, I've definitely presented quite a bit of data on that, but um, applicants like to hear this from admissions uh, members of the school. So would you mind walking us through what it means to be non-traditional, maybe give some examples on who should be identified as non-traditional and perhaps who should not identify as non-traditional? Mm -hmm. um, so it's... Um... I love this question. I think, um, Ricky, when you have asked um, members of admissions committees, representatives from all the schools, everybody loves the question. And it's really a way for an applicant to um, add some other details. And um, the path sometimes, if it's non-traditional, can be a little tricky and hard to identify where, where the motivation came from. Um, why are you on this path now? So that's a great place to do that. Um, we see all kinds of answers. Do you consider yourself, I think the question is something like, do you consider yourself non-traditional? Mm -hmm. We see all kinds of responses once a person has said yes. I think that when it has been brought up before um, by Mr. Hasso in those settings, no, none of us can come up with one definition, right, Enrique? Isn't that right? Everybody's offering various opinions, but I think we all want to leave it open. So I think automatically you think of, um, now if you're designing a study, looking at, um, you know, going to put something into the literature, you need to be a little more, um, it, the definition needs to be clear, but I think we all are preferring it to be open. I think the first thing that comes to mind is the traditional path is schooling, high school, college for four years, and then right on into um, medical school or professional school. Many, many, many people in our class for the last few years, almost half of those people in the classes have had at least one year out. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that you would consider a non-traditional person, a person with a gap year. That's a pretty, that's 
in terms of just the pathway, that's a pretty traditional path right now um, is to take at least a gap year. So is it somebody who's had a career before? Are you out there um, knowing you wanted to do medicine for a long time, but just um, for circumstances, you're, you're coming back to it right now. There are just all kinds of reasons. And I think, um, I think you just need to explain in that, in that question why you think it's a little bit of a different path for you. You've got other places to talk about challenges and you've got that personal statement also. Um, so you've got places to do that. Um, and I think it's up, I really think it's up to the individual person to tell us more about their story there. And I think on the receiving end, we have to be very open to whatever, whatever that story is. And if we want to define it, then we'll come up with a definition for people, for the applicant to know about. But right now it's open. <clears throat> is there any scenario where you would recommend that an applicant not say that they're non-traditional, even though they are? Um, or does that give you some additional insight into maybe some other aspect of the applicant's mm -hmm. um, psyche or their, or their critical thinking? Yes. When, when we were first looking at answers to this question, I know that um, just a, a committee member or two, until we had discussions about how, how are we going to evaluate the answers to this question, a committee member or two would say, well, they're saying they're non-traditional. They're saying they are, and really they're not. But they were telling us things that did um, add to their story. So how can you, you know... Um, we can't really make that judgment, but people would, for example, tell us about working through school or hardships that they had through school um, that they thought made them a little unconventional or non-traditional. People, we got a few answers, um, as you know, um, from people who had families. That's pretty, that's pretty unusual. That's pretty unique. I would say that that's non-traditional, and that's why I hate to define it um, because yeah. we could define it and then there are always other um, answers that we would accept, you know, as, as being unique. Yeah, and if, if I could be the voice for some of the other members of that council, um, they also want to, you know, the essay that comes along with uh, identifying yourself as non-traditional is not meant to advantage or disadvantage any applicant. Yeah. It gives additional insight into your overall journey. Um, and ultimately, uh, along with what you were just saying, Dr. Kellaway, the question really addresses different aspects of a person's um, situation. But I do want to remind a lot of our applicants um, who may have situations like that but do not identify as non-traditional, you are able to discuss that in the optional essay. So don't see the non-traditional uh, essay portion as the opportunity for you to talk about any hardships, um, even though you may not be a non-traditional student, yeah. um, but rather use it as the opportunity to discuss something that, that identifies you as somebody who may not be following a traditional pathway. Mm -hmm. I think that is such an important point um, because I know we all get questions also um, mm -hmm. Do I have to come up with something in the optional essay, right? So that's such a good point. This does not, answering no, I don't consider myself non-traditional. Um, we might read your essays and your, your application say pretty unique and, and um, non-traditional in our opinion, mm -hmm. but to put no, that you're not going to um, go into that question there um, does not disadvantage a person at all, and yeah. nor does um, leaving out the optional essay disadvantage someone. So I think that's a that's a very good point. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, this is a uh, live Q and A, so we are getting some good. live questions now. Uh, our first question is from Delhi. Um, I apologize if that's not how you pronounce your name. Um, one person asked, um, what is the advantage of applying before June 1st, uh, which is the date that primary applications will begin to be transmitted to school? So 
um, for those who may have just heard about June 1st, uh, for this application cycle, the application deadline has been extended due to impacts caused by COVID-19. And in addition to that, TMDSAS will not be transmitting applications until June 1st, um, which is something new for this year. So uh, Dr. Kellaway, if you could give us some insight into whether there's a, even any advantage on the school's end uh, for getting an application in before June 1st. Yes, um, I think we can, um, we could just talk for an hour about this, couldn't we? All of the, the impacts from COVID. From the very beginning, all of the TMDSAS institutions um, with undergrad, our undergrad partners have been having these conversations. We understand the stress. We understand the additional stress placed on an already stressful process um, that has been caused by COVID-19. So we are ready to push everything back. We are reassuring people all over the place through the Texas Education Service newsroom. Um, and um, that's refreshed constantly should there be any changes. But yes, for a yes. long time, we've tried to tell people um, that um, we expect some applications to come later. We know all about the MCAT cancellations that still are being worked out. Um, people are being bumped. I think we finally have some, uh, some good dates from mm -hmm. the uh, MCAT people, but we know, and I think everybody agreed, the school, the medical schools agreed that we kind of do this anyway. We, we leave openings at Long School of Medicine. We're inviting people a couple, two to four weeks in advance. In December, towards our last dates, we are inviting people a week and two in advance. So we, we've got open spots the whole season. Most schools do that. We don't get the first batch of applications and fill our thousand spots or our 800 spots or our 1200 spots, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we are reaffirming that. Um, the first part I wanted Enrique maybe to mention because he is he is the guy, he's the man who put all of these initial statistics together for us years ago about applying early. So the way Delhi worded their question was, what's the advantage? Mm -hmm. So I think if you're, so Enrique, do you, uh, we know the first time you pulled those stats together, May, June, July comprised, go, you wanna go t tell us about the statistics? Sure. So all we did was, was pull um, the applicant submission date um, and that um, it was only based off of the application submission date. We didn't look at when test scores arrived or when letters arrived or when transcripts were processed, but just solely looking at the application submission test date. Uh, I'm sorry, application submission date. And we noted that um, May June and July were the months where applicants want to be, be able to hit submit on their application because that allows the schools a, essentially the most amount of time to look at your application and review it. And I do want to reemphasize that even though you submit your application, you do not have to have your letters of evaluation in, you do not have to have your test scores in, and you do not need your transcripts. In fact, this year for transcripts, those will not be submitted to TMDSAS until TMDSAS requests them, which could be later uh, as far as the fall. Um, so just keep in mind that those earlier months um, are kind of key, not necessarily for you to get an invitation to interview, but to maximize the amount of time that a school can look at your application. Mm -hmm. And TMDSAS and the schools are in constant communication. We, we discussed this last week when we had uh, Alana and Nicole from TMDSAS talked to us about the updates that they sent to the schools. Um, and so, you know, there are constant updates with, whenever a semester ends, the GPA changes and all of those updates happen on the schools. And when test scores arrive, all of those updates come out. Uh, and so there, there are quite a few, uh, the, the schools and TMDSAS are in constant communication with any update to your application like that. Great. So, this, there, there, Enrique has shown that there's a statistical advantage because those early months comprise most of the interview invites. But if 
but I, I, I'm not playing devil's advocate. I'm saying that it is an individual journey. And if you are not ready and you haven't reflected enough um, for a personal essay, you know, to be meaningful and give us some depth of who you are, you know, tell us your array of personal attributes, or if you haven't reflected on those experiences that you're writing about, you need to take time to do that. And so there's not anything key. There are plenty of people invited who submitted later. Um, so just watch that. And, and you can always submit and not worry about the MCAT. Don't wait for your MCAT score to come in. If the rest of the package is ready and it's your year and everything's in order, submit it and then uh, continue your MCAT study until it gets done. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have another question that just came in to the chat uh, and that has to do about the chronology of activities. Um, this is from Jordan. Uh, does this include time we were enrolled in school or is it only the compilation of our activities? Um, the chronology of activities, and I'll take this one because it's a, more of an application question. The chronology of activities compiles every activity that you've taken and all of your coursework. Uh, and what it does is it lays out everything from the time that you graduated from high school all the way through the point when you hit submit on your application. Uh, and it puts that all together in a, in a single timeline. Uh, for the schools. And so the schools are able to see uh, in order exactly how your entire application comes into into action. Um, so yes, it does include your semesters um, on the chronology of activities. And we do have some more questions that came in previously, but if you all are watching right now, we welcome any questions that you have for Dr. Calloway from the Long School of Medicine, who is joining us today. We're really excited to have you. Um, the... Enrique? Yes. Uh, um, let me ask uh, Dr. Calloway a question Please. that I'm getting, um, and almost from every student, and that is, do, do the medical schools want to know how COVID has affected the student? Do they, they're talking about making their, all their, es or one of their essays about COVID and, um, my impression was that everyone's going through this, so it's not a unique uh, experience. However, how each person uh, deals with it is, but if you could address that. Sure. <clears throat> our, <clears throat> um, our TMDSAS group has decided not to add that as a specific question because we think it will come up throughout the throughout the application anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I would, we do see schools in our listserv, we see schools that have added, um, you know, questions about COVID and how it has um, impacted your journey. I would say because it's a marathon and not, mm -hmm. not a pre-medical pathway defined by this semester, as Enrique said first, that you want to make sure all of those other good things are in there, all of the rest of the journey is in there. And if they're, um, you know, if you were blessed that none of your family were affected and um, uh, you can talk about your challenges, um, but I would say that there might be some other things to highlight. You know, if you adjusted to working and studying from home, uh, certainly it caused stress. Certainly it absolutely did. But if you got adjusted and you're finishing out the semester and maybe you turned to some unique way to do community service or to continue doing something medical, tell us about that. Um, but uh, we, ex I think we would expect a lot of other things in there, you know? Thank you. You're welcome. And following up on the whole COVID-19 impacts, um, with the MCAT being delayed with, and several test dates being postponed, um, we actually pulled this data up on what other application cycles look like, depending on when applicants took their MCAT or DAT. And we actually found out that almost half of all applicants would have taken the MCAT or DAT um, in the months of uh, March, April, and June almost half. So 
For those of you out there who are suffering from any delays or postponements of your test, you're not alone. Uh, Dr. Kellaway, what are the schools doing to address that right now? Mm -hmm. um, I think we are, um, we have no control, of course. Um, we have input. They have asked us, um, MCAT comes across with surveys, um, has come across with surveys for us more than once. Um, and I think they're doing their best to remediate things from their end. As far as admissions committees, not just in Texas, but across the nation, um, our conversations are that we'll pay attention to late MCATs. Um, I, I, we have all told many uh, pre-meds to use this time to study better, study more, study, you know, if there was a section that you know, you just didn't quite have time for. Now you've now now you've gotten a little extra time, maybe to do some things. So we know that scores are kind of going to come in late, and we're going to have interview spots. In fact, our interview, um, all of our interview cycles, probably across the nation, are going uh, to extend a month or two. We usually complete our um, interviews in December. We just today scheduled uh, into January and February knowing that the match was going to be in March. So study well. We know it's not, you know, your original time plan, but we'll, we'll be paying attention. Yeah. And so for that person who probably can get in until that September 27th or 28th test date, that should not be an issue with right. getting an interview. That's correct. That's correct. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, and this might be a, a tag team effort question that we're going gonna to ask next. Um, but with activities impacting, uh, being impacted by COVID-19, uh, you know, several people had shadowing experiences that have been canceled over the summer, volunteer experiences that may have been what they see as their make or break points. Uh, would you mind addressing how schools are kind of um, taking a look at those and maybe any encouraging words that you might be able to share to someone who has experienced a cancellation or delay in an activity that they thought would be really monumental in their application. Yes, sure. And I think uh, Deb's probably got a lot of um, questions coming into her about that um, as well. Um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. This one, what Enrique said at the very beginning was this one, um, this one semester, even if it sort of extends into the summer, doesn't define everything, but certainly there are people out there who are very disappointed um, because their, <clears throat> excuse me, their healthcare experience or some other wonderful opportunity was canceled. Um, I think our, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what creative things people are going to do. Um, I uh, shared with Enrique, I don't know if it's on your website somewhere, but you know, I was just thinking if I had time now, instead of shadowing on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, um, I wrote down some of the things I would do, explore uh, an organ system. And we've got this on our website. Enrique might have it um, in the education service place somewhere, but explore an organ system, like really delve into that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, if you go to our website, um, go to Long School of Medicine, go to admissions and in our COVID bar, um, it's not very pretty, but what a fun idea. Take, take the heart and look at the anatomy. Um, when, you're, uh, when you're through with that, move on to its physiology and function, um, how, how everything is innervated there, what's the vascularization, so delve deeper into some anatomical and physiological details, then start uh, looking at common diseases, common treatments, common laboratories or imaging techniques that we use to evaluate a problem with the heart. How fun would that be? When you go to YouTube or just Google um, examination of the heart or pulmonary exam, you're going to see a physician. It's not as good as in person. It's not as fun as in person, but it's there and there will be a physician there walking you through how to listen to the mitral valve, where to place, you know, how to use the bell versus the uh, diaphragm. So you can get a lot out of that. Um, and I dare say, maybe even more than in some strictly shadowing 
where you're not able to be as engaged in the patient encounter as possible. The other things quickly that I listed there were read a book by a physician. I love Robert Seltzer. He's um, a writer from long, long ago, but it, he's got a collection, uh, several collections of short stories. So those are, uh, and they're provocative. They are something that you stop and go, mm, you know, I didn't think about it that way, or I can't believe he's writing this. So uh, there are some very interesting stories or write a, uh, uh, read a book about medicine. Um, read about Henrietta Lacks's story or some of these other uh, great things that are out there. Deb, Let's I'll let you have a turn. Okay. Um, I, I agree with all of those things. There are a lot of things that you can do. You can also get involved through perhaps your religious community and some community service work that you're doing. Um, there are ways to reach out to perhaps um, senior members of your community who may need groceries delivered, uh, who need um, just a helping hand in some way. Um, so there, there are many different ways to, to get involved. And again, I, I think as Dr. Calloway says that this speaks to your creativity and uh, your critical analysis skills and not just having, yeah, maybe your internship was canceled, uh, but um, there are other things you can do and, and there are many different programs. There are some apps that of uh, gross anatomy apps that are very interesting and um, they're not too expensive. There may be some free ones out there. I don't know. But um, again, it, it speaks to your ingenuity and uh, how you think of things in your own community. And maybe there are people who need help with the MCAT and that will only increase your knowledge of the MCAT questions as well. Great idea. Um, so um, just get involved. Thank you. Can I add um, when you, uh, I think there are a couple of things that successful students have in common and that's organization and discipline. And so if you are, um, if you are browsing around doing some other sort of healthcare things, I would, I would really do it in a disciplined fashion so that it really does replace that time so you can talk about it um, more concretely, instead of spending X number of hours, I spent it here and there. Um, it, I think it's going to be um, a little bit better um, to get in depth with an activity and then be able to write about it a little bit better in the uh, personal biography section. Does that make sense? Do you know what I'm saying? It does. If you yeah. can say, yeah, that every Tuesday, here's what I did, mm -hmm. you know. And then on Saturdays, I delivered groceries and, you know, come up with a, a, a creative plan to how to um, do some of these things. Yeah, I really like the idea that discipline and organization are two mm -hmm. key factors in mm -hmm. success. Um, I think those two really come at play right now when, you know, everybody's in the exact same situation where yeah. your plans for the future seem to be completely derailed uh, as far as they go. You know, you had your master plan since you were in high school that you were going to take the MCAT in the spring, and then you were going to, uh, you know, shadow an ophthalmologist over the summer of your junior year, and now all of that is out the window. So how do you step up and use your creativity and use your resilience to bounce back from that? Um, that that's really powerful. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right. We are getting some more questions in our chat. Great. So... Um, hello. Uh, first off, uh, Dr. Beck got a shout out. Dr. Beck, you are the best. UNT loves you. Oh, of course. That's nice. Yeah. That's why we're so happy to have Dr. Beck on our team. We're very lucky uh, to have her and so thankful for you to be able to join us. And uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Beck is the one that came up with the idea of these courage sessions. So if you find these helpful, uh, do give a shout out to Dr. Beck. Um, can't, get, can't get her enough of those. 
Uh, so our, our next question that came up, uh, hello, I saw that TMDSES is accepting all courses graded as pass-fail this semester, meaning spring 2020, uh, but I just wanted to clarify that this includes prerequisite courses. Uh, the short answer is, yes, it does include prerequisite courses. Uh, and that policy is in, in effect for spring 2020 because it is the semester that was uh, affected by courses being moved from in-person to online. And there've been a lot of uh, tumultuous changes going on in a very short amount of time, which is why all of the TMDSS schools uh, came together and agreed upon that policy that all courses that are credit, no credit, um, pass, fail, are going to be looked at for the spring of 2020 uh, to be equal uh, to a class that may have been a grade, graded course. Uh, it does not look like uh, that may be extended into the summer. Uh, in those events, um, we don't have guidance yet from the advisory council uh, quite yet on what the summer 2020 is going to look like in terms of accepting a pass-fail course. Um, but some of the discussions that are going on right now are that if you have the option to get a graded course, uh, that you should pursue that, but they may still continue to accept credit, no credit, or pass fail. However, again, this is all um, just a discussion that's going on uh, among the schools. And once we get new information on that, it'll be posted on our COVID-19 newsroom uh, for TMDCS and the Texas Health Education Service. All right, our next question. How are applications going to be evaluated with MCAT retesters um, with the previous scores that are much lower? Should we apply soon or wait until the new score comes out? Apply when it's the best possible story you can tell. And then um, don't let that interrupt your MCAT study plan. And again, organization and discipline um, are going to make you really successful on the MCAT. Um, the AAMC, can I plug the AAMC? They have Please. some low resource, uh, I'd like to, uh, they have some low resource, um, some low cost resources is what I'm trying to say. And one of them, whoever I am talking to, I recommend do this first. Um, they have a, um, a manual that you can download for free and it is six steps to planning your MCAT study. Um, the first step they want you to spend, they say this should take you 50 to 60 hours just to look at the resources that are out there for you to plug into an organized study plan. So I, I don't know, did that help? So think, apply, yeah. yes, apply and then continue studying, studying for the MCAT. Yeah, and, and just as a reminder, you know, if you do have a, a test score that you're improving on uh, and you're not able to schedule your retest date, uh, you know, the schools see, see that you have a previous MCAT and they'll see that score. They'll see it anyway because it's a recent score. Uh, but also uh, the schools see that you're going to retake the MCAT. And so that shows that, A, they'll be expecting a new score based off of the new date that you've provided. And B, they're seeing that you're working to improve and that you're not just resting on that previous MCAT. Right. Mm -hmm. A related thing sometimes that we hear is um, how are schools going to look? I have to take it now for the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time. How are schools going to interpret that? Is that bad? So stop worrying about that. All good things are good. Get a new plan together. Make sure you look at what you were doing before to earn those scores and make sure you figure out what it is you need to do differently. Um, at our school, our committee really says, gosh, that's, that's some determination. That's um, this person is really committed to this path. They're trying to do their best. Can I say something else? Please. I can't say any short answers. I'm sorry. But <laughs> no, this great. Is, have... <laughs> and your notes later sort of address this, but um um, you are not taking the MCAT to check off the box and because schools say you have to jump this hurdle. It is, it is, it's, it is again, organization and discipline that you will use once you're successful and you, you tackle that test with all of that um, focus study an organized plan and come up with a great score. You are using those skills from the time you step on the medical school campus. 
its organization, its discipline. Can I take all of this complicated information and, and show what I know? The schools are gonna ask you that from day one to the very end. So it's not even just about practicing to take a standardized test. It's, um, it's, it's many other skills, it's organization, it's discipline, it's focus, it's taking, um, taking a lot of materials into context and, and understanding them and showing that you understand it, so. Mm -hmm. Those sound like a lot of core competencies that you just mentioned. Yes. Yeah, all of them play in tandem. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, more questions. Um, we have an applicant who is from out of state and is particularly drawn to Texas due to an interest in serving the Latinx Hispanic population. And they are curious if Lone School of Medicine has anything in their curriculum that equips students with valuable tools or skills to work with this particular population. Yes, so um, it is in our mission statement also um, that we um, love our, uh, we're, we're making physicians to, um, serve the South Texas area. It's, it's, it's one part of our mission. We're also um, training people to go around the world and be great doctors around the world, but South Texas certainly is um, uh, on our radar. The AAMC awarded Long School of Medicine um, a, a prize for a recognition for reaching out into the community. We have seven community clinics that our faculty and our students are um, very, very active in. And um, so, and, and that community service learning thread starts with things that are embedded in our curriculum. So yes, the curriculum does specifically address that. Um, and I'm sure other schools do too. And we have um, medical Spanish elective and um, like many schools do, we offer an opportunity to do, after you do a Spanish elective, to do a Spanish only exam to practice your skills. So um, yes, yes, we do. Thank you. And if I could throw this also at Dr. Beck, uh, for students, for applicants who are uh, maybe a couple of years away from applying to school like Long School of Medicine that have, you know, serving, um, specific populations or specific demographic or regions, um, how can an applicant start preparing for that kind of curriculum or showing, or, or what can they do to show the schools that um, they're interested in pursuing that specific method mission? Well, I think certainly uh, working with um, targeted populations and for one thing, learn learn the language of the people you want to work with. You, you can't have a, certainly translators are good, but it, if you want to be um, a doctor and treat um, Hispanic people or even a Vietnamese population, you need to know the language so that you can communicate personally. And, um, you know, work, work in the community. There are um, many different ways to get involved with uh, food banks, with if you want to serve underserved population. Right now, there are a lot of hungry people. And um, that's a, a good way to get involved with uh, some organizations to do that kind of work. Um, look around. Um, and and see see what's needed. Yeah, some universities, you. Uh, you know, have food banks also. Mm -hmm. Many of them do uh, because there are hungry students as well. Yeah, if, if I could offer some personal insight uh, as a polyglot, uh, speaking Spanish in different environments or speaking a different language in different environments, even if it is your native language, you may not have the vocabulary to express what you need to mm -hmm. uh, effectively. And so being in situations like that, where you learn the, uh, essentially the jargon for uh, that specific scenario, for example, um, you know, medical terminology is very different than Spanish. 
Uh, and depending which region uh, of Spanish you're native in, uh, one word may mean one thing and, and it's something completely different in a neighboring country. And here in the United States, you know, we have such a melting pot of people from so many different backgrounds that you want to make sure that you're able to communicate effectively. So uh, for those of you who may be curious about uh, pursuing uh, any schools that target specific demographics, or if you are just interested yourself in uh, helping specific demographics and you speak the language, I urge you to challenge yourself in that. Um, uh, particularly in Texas, we have a very large Hispanic population, but also a very large uh, Vietnamese population. Mm -hmm. and I've definitely spoken to many uh, Vietnamese students, and I've, I've let them know, you know, uh, Vietnamese is a really great asset for you to have. It. It's a great tool in your toolbox as a physician, or as a dentist, or a veterinarian. All right, we've got Good more idea. questions. Yeah, Good lots idea. more questions coming. Here we go. Um, why is there a delay in sending transcripts this year? I apologize if this was addressed earlier. It actually was addressed uh, last week with the team this yes folks, Alana and Nicole. Um, the very short answer is that the transcripts are actually not required in processing your application and sending it to the schools. They actually don't come into play until much later in the cycle. So to ease the burden on applicants, uh, Team DCS has moved the transcript uh, requirements until the point at which they require or they request the transcripts from you. So the best thing you can do as an applicant is be ready. If you have already finished all the courses at a specific school, you might hold on to those transcripts until Team DCS asks them from you. If you do have transcripts that you're holding on to, please make sure that they remain in a sealed envelope so that when you send them to TMDSAS, they are still valid. If you do open the envelope, uh, those transcripts uh, are no longer usable by us. Uh, and so you wanna make sure you, to, you adhere to those uh, requirements. Uh, next question. Uh, I learned through the podcast that Long School of Medicine, as well as others, will be incorporating a video aspect to the secondary. Can you go into greater detail about what to expect from that? That's that's definitely for you, Dr. Calloway. Yes, um, we're so excited about this. Um, now it takes on, I don't know if it's got a new meeting, meaning or we are putting it in a different context um, because the this initial word, here we are in early May, people are talking already about just going to a virtual system. Um, we really, really hope we can do in person. Um, I think that we are all becoming Zoom experts and there are a lot of great things about it, um, but we really hope we can do some things in person. We had planned and still plan to ask students, but highly encourage students to do our SOVI, standardized one-way video interview, SOVI. Um, we're using a platform called SparkHire and um, we will be asking people to make, it's like a two minute presentation, I think. Um, we're gonna ask two questions on this platform of everyone. It's a way, it's another standardized experience. GPA is not, you know, looking at your metrics is not a, those metrics, it, that's not a standardized experience. The MCAT is a pretty standardized experience. MMI, um, those try to be a standardized experience for all of the um, participants, all of the ap applicants. We have a pretty traditional um, interview process to uh, two 30 minute interviews with one with a faculty member, one with a student. So this was a way to add a component of standardization so that everybody was experiencing the same thing. We'll ask two questions. You can look at them ahead of time. You can look today and see what those questions are and look at any introductions and uh, instructions. You can come back uh, in some time period. We're going to ask for it right around. It will be useful for committee right around um, the interview, a week or two after the interview. Beyond that, it may not be have impact. Um, and then anyway, you can bring notes, you can decide, okay, I'm gonna to record today and then record your answer to those responses. We piloted this last fall with a um, pre-med group in, in San Antonio with um, an outreach event. And when the committee saw these 
uh, young people presenting on the spot actually with no preparation, um, which would be different, but we were just blown away. Everybody did such a, a beautiful job. And some of these pre-meds were early on in the process talking about the issues in, in healthcare that they've heard about that are important to them. Um, beautiful answers. And so we said, we're not going to require it quite yet, but we're going to offer it and highly recommend it because it made a very positive impact for all of those individuals when committee members reviewed them. So I think it's just one a great way to show your professionalism and present just a little piece of yourself in the answer um, in an organized um, in an organized and, and practiced response. So we're excited. You're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. uh, we're, we're definitely excited to hear how uh, it's going to end up being used and how applicants respond to it. Um, yeah. That is a, something that's still relatively new in this space. Yes. We got positive responses um, so far, but we'll see. You know, I know all of these little things, the Casper made people nervous. Now everybody's doing the Casper or soon it will be everybody. And we'll, you know, we'll help you through it. No school is really trying to drill you or um, create an uncomfortable environment. We want it to, we want you to be relaxed with it, um, but show what you've got, you know, mm -hmm. which does require some planning and thought. Yeah, but it's not a gotcha situation. No, not at all, not at all. All right, um, we have a, another question, but before we dig into that one, you brought up Casper, uh, and that's actually uh, something we haven't addressed in response to COVID-19 this year mm -hmm. uh, quite yet. So uh, can you let us know if there are any changes or any suggestions that we might be able to offer applicants this cycle? Yes, um, the, the CASPER is widely used. Chances are you are going to be applying to a school that's requiring the CASPER. Um, we require it. We don't require it of all of our applicants. It turns out that most people do take it, but um, we require it of the people that we invite for interview. Um, I think Lubbock does that also, I think, uh, but we, you know, I don't want to speak for other schools. So it's good for you to know about it. It's good for you to prepare for it. Um, even the Casper folks up until about last year said there's no way to prepare. Now they are saying, of course, there are ways that you can prepare. Um, okay, that's a whole other presentation. I'm trying to draw up the uh, slide. I just talked to a group uh, in Austin about this. Um, there are lots. Yes, if go. I interrupt. Uh, you also did talk about this on the episode of the podcast where we discussed Casper. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Um, but I've learned a lot since then. I've learned some other <laughs> <Y 'all> things. <laughs> you know, and again, you're not practicing. You should definitely like get on the keyboard and be efficient at typing. Um, you should be very efficient at trying to get some thoughts together in your head and put them into the test scenario. Mm -hmm. the, the idea has often been voiced as we're just trying, you can't prepare because this is who you are and we're just seeing how, what of those attributes you've, you, what personal attributes you've got, of those ones we all know are listed on the AAMC or by the schools as their criteria. It's really not it's really not a litmus test. It's really not a lab test. Do you have ability to work in teams? Do you have the capacity to evaluate yourself? Thank goodness we're all growing with time and experience. So you should give yourself, even if you haven't been in a scenario where you are in a difficult situation and people are um, people are in your group or having a conflict about contribution to the team effort or something like that. If you haven't been in that situation, think about it. What would you do? You, so you need to seek out these scenarios. They're all over the internet and just spend time in an organized and disciplined way yes. to find the scenario. What would I do? Think about what, what personal attribute can I uh, demonstrate in this? Can I demonstrate leadership? Can I demonstrate compassion? 
Can I demonstrate, um, what else do we want to know? Honesty and integrity. What, what of those personal attributes that are tested by the CASPER? And they'll, they list 10 of them uh, there to, for starters. They cover most everything. What can I demonstrate in this, in this scenario? So it's not cheating on the test. It's not me telling you to do this is not trying to teach you for the test. It's trying to expand your abilities, you know, um, just thinking, you might not be in the situation, but thinking about the situation, what could I do as a person in this scenario is mm -hmm. a, I think a good way. That's how I would practice. I probably right. need some practice, you know. And Dr. Beck, we actually saw from the folks at Altus, which manages the the Casper assessment, we saw a sample set from them at our conference uh, back in February. It seems January, it seems like a lifetime ago now. Um, I don't know about you, but I definitely felt a little out of my element, really unprepared for, you know, jotting down what my responses were. Um, and we saw that on the schedule pretty far in advance. I don't know how, what your reaction was to seeing some of the scenarios, that, particularly the test scenario that um, the Casper folks shared. Oh, you're mute. You're muted as well. Sorry. Uh, if you're not prepared, I mean, if it's the first time you've seen anything like that, you'll be at a disadvantage, I think. Uh, again, as Dr. Kellaway says, preparation is always good and thinking ahead to some things that might be on there. And I think most of those uh, Casper situations are not medical. They're just- there, None are. Yeah, just little everyday things that may come up. And so everyone should be able to handle the situation that's presented. But again, surprises usually aren't much fun. And yeah. uh, so think ahead and, and make up some things. Uh, you know, that, oh, what would I do if this happened? Um, or, you know, if, if you're maybe a farm tech and somebody came in and wanted to um, return some medication that didn't work or something, you know, I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, just think ahead. Yeah, I know it threw, it threw me for a loop. So, uh, and I, uh, Dr. Beck, you and I are poets, so <laughs> we, you know, we read a lot, we write a lot, and and to have seen a scenario where it was just like deer in the headlights, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. not not quite ready for it. I think uh, Dr. Kellaway shares some really uh, powerful advice. Um, I say this with the utmost respect to all of our pre-health students, but uh, I've seen how some of y'all write, uh, and <laughs> we we definitely want to make sure that you're in a situation where you're able to express yourself in, a, in an effective manner. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that you uh, take Dr. Kellaway's advice to heart and really uh, not necessarily prepare for the Casper, but prepare to be in a situation like that. Because mm -hmm. um, there will be many situations throughout the application cycle where you have to be able to formulate a complete thought uh, essentially on a moment's notice. You, know, you have your interviews, you have your video assessments, you have your Casper assessment, um, so just be prepared. All right. We have two more questions that came up. Um, the first one, uh, I plan to visit Long School of Medicine when my flight was canceled, given the current situation. Will there be any virtual opportunities to learn more about the school via virtual tours or something of the like? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. So thank <laughs> you um, for, um, thank you for that. I think you just may have like floated something to the top again. Um, we have in-person spring and fall explore events. Um, we have talks and visits with the medical students and tours and things like that. So it has, uh, it's time to do one. So watch for it. Um, you would be notified if you're a club pre-med member and we have your email um, and we've got that um, Facebook page um, or maybe we'll get Enrique to tell you about it too. Maybe he'll post it too uh, when we come up with a date. We just did for our new students uh, on Saturday, uh, I think we're Zoom experts now. Um, we did over 200 people um, 
who are new uh, new students joining our class in the fall in the summer and we had over 200 people there over 180 um, people who will be in the new class of um, 2024 and then 60 plus of our students we had 50 breakout rooms and uh, things going on uh, for a little mini virtual tour so that gave us confidence um, that we could, you know, and we didn't get closed down or, or shut off or interrupted. So it all worked mischief managed. Right. So we can, um, so thank you for that. We'll be watching for the date because we absolutely could do something like that. I'm writing will, it down right now. And we will definitely share it on our online communities, the community Services hub and the non-traditional applicants groups, and also on the Texas health education service page. Um, we actually, Speaking for another school, uh, UTMB actually has a virtual event coming up. Uh, we posted uh, about that in our online communities uh, and we'll be sharing that information on the Texas Health Education Service page. And again, as more events start coming up, we will definitely be sharing those uh, with everyone. All right, we have, uh, looks like one last question. <clears throat> Are the metrics currently available regarding non-traditional students who matriculated? And also a, a kind note, uh, will there be, uh, I'm sorry, um, thank you so much for everything that you do to keep everything as transparent as possible. Enrique, Dr. Calloway, and Dr. Beck. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's nice. You're very yeah, welcome. So, so as far as um, non-traditional metrics, I think I might be the one to address that. Um, historically speaking, our non-traditional students have not fared quite as well as a cohort uh, as our traditional students do. Uh, there are many factors that come into that, which is why we've been so involved in engaging non-traditional students and in providing opportunities on the application for the schools to get further insight into non-traditional students. This is a, essentially an ongoing study into non-traditional students and how, they're, how they fare overall. Uh, I will tell you, um, looking at entire cohorts, the entire cohort for um, each application cycle has a certain GPA, let's say, um, or let's let's look at MCAT because I can recite those numbers off my off the top of my head. Um, the overall MCAT score uh, average was a 510 for matriculated students this past year. About five points below that was our average reapplicants, and about five. Uh, three to five points below that, I believe, uh, were our non-traditional students. Mm -hmm. And so non-traditional students have historically um, not been as academically competitive as traditional students. Um, there are many, many factors that go into that, so we're not uh, concluding anything here. Um, but this is definitely something that the schools are looking at, and it's absolutely something that we at the Texas Health Education Service are studying. Um, this is actually a project that I'm taking on right now. I have a presentation uh, for the National uh, Association of Advisors for Health Professions conference next month uh, that I'll be leading virtually, uh, where we're looking longitudinally at what non-traditional students look like academically uh, on the TMDCS application. So this is definitely something that we're looking into. What does it mean for you as an applicant? Uh, it means that your journey is ultimately what gets you in. Uh, the MCAT and your GPA will show the schools that you are academically capable of handling the rigors uh, academically, but it's gonna be those non-academic things uh, in your application, your activities, your experiences are really gonna set you apart. Um, those evaluations from other folks, from your advisor, from physicians from dentists or veterinarians, um, those are really what's gonna set you apart and what really can make the, can be your make or break points. Um, and Dr. Kellaway, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have plenty to share as well in, in terms of encouragement for non-traditional students. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, my message is we, this is something we're definitely looking at. It's not conclusive quite yet, uh, but you shouldn't let it uh, deter you from pursuing this pathway. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, your, your inspiration, your calling, um, your motivation is going to take you 
through and see you through. It's not easy, um, but you know, you just hang in there, try to do better, try to get ideas. Lots of us have, uh, will, will help you with that. Um, it's, such an, it's such an individual thing. We do look at everybody's entire story. It's not just about metrics. So uh, I know the question was about metrics, but um, lots of people have ways to show um, that they can, uh, that they're not an academic risk and, um, and all of the other wonderful things that they can bring. So it's, it's, it really isn't all about the numbers. Great. Um, Dr. Beck, you had some challenge questions for our applicants um, that we had discussed and I have them written down here. Um, unless you, you have them as well, would you like to share? No, those? no, I don't have them in front of me. I'm sorry. Mickey. No, it's all right. I do want to emphasize that these are Dr. Beck's, this is Dr. Beck's work, not my sorry. own. I'm just <laughs> quoting it now. Uh, but she had some, some challenges for you all as applicants. Um, the first challenge is, are you participating in volunteering, shadowing research or other activities that help you get into the school of your dreams? Uh, and right now that challenge is very unique in that these might not be the most traditional ways uh, or the most uh, direct activities that you had envisioned, uh, but what are you doing to get into the school that you want to attend? And the second challenge question that Dr. Beck came up with was, uh, are you doing these activities to become a better healthcare provider? What are you doing right now? And Dr. Callaway definitely shared a great amount of things that you could be doing on your end, uh, including <clears throat> leveraging some online resources, uh, which we will link to in the description uh, that are available on the Long School of Medicine website for you to continue to be uh, intellectually curious about this pathway are you volunteering or having other opportunities that you're taking advantage of to reach out to other people uh, right now? And are you using, you know, we're, we're in a weird time right now where a lot of test dates are delayed, but are you using that time to maximize your study abilities and really get the score and above and beyond that you had uh, envisioned for yourself? So those are a few challenge questions for you all and hopefully they'll help motivate you. Uh, Dr. Beck, do you have any uh, closing statements today? Uh, I just want to uh, send my encouragement out to the entire group because uh, it is a little different. And even for the reapplicants, it can be quite a bit different. And I apologize. My dog thought we were going to have a vet session today, apparently. So, um, so I do want to send my encouragement to you and let us know if you have questions. Thank you, and Dr. Kelway. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's always um, a treat to be with you, and it was great to see you, Deb, um, and all of you out there. Um, you know, there are so many people out there who want to help you um, with this path. So um, I just I said it again. I said it before. You know, it's hard, but uh, so keep some inspiration around you and keep plugging along think about ways to um, accomplish this and we're all here to help you. So reach out, let us know how we can help you. And yeah, thanks again um, for having me. This was uh, fun. My favorite thing to do, you know, My too. Call and help people out there. So yes, and we thanks. all, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and talk thank back. You. And thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. And a and, uh, final challenge to you all, find ways to be organized and disciplined. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, thank you. Thank you.